Hello and welcome back to another MDCT free webinar. This next lecture we're going to talk about is a two series lecture on emergency radiology imaging. It's a radiographer's approach in a critical situation. This is the first part of a two part series. So in this lecture we're going to look at primarily only head CT imaging and we're going to look at the patterns and analysis of bleeds. But before we start, we're going to look at how we center and position. Really importantly, you always need to have the head in the center of the actual gantry. Secondly, the radiographic base baseline needs to be perpendicular to the floor. Thirdly, you never want a hyperextend or a hyperflexed head because the whole point is to have the petrous temporal ridge superimposed over the roof of cranium. In a study that we had conducted where we looked at image quality relative to radiation dose and patient centering, we actually found that if you were off-centered for a simple head CT, you actually reduced the contrast to noise ratio between the gray and white matter. This is really important, especially in pediatric imaging where subtle bleeds can be missed. A typical CT protocol would involve 120 kVp. There's a lot of information out there to tell you that you need to go to 100 kVp or use 140. At 100 kVp, you will get better low contrast resolution, whereas at high kVp, at 140, you will lose that. So the disadvantages of 100 kVp is that you will get more windmill artifact or hard beam artifact because of the petrous temporal ridge, which sits at a critical area at the cerebro pontine angle. At 140 kVp, we will miss those subtle early signs of acute stroke and thus unable to quantify or determine whether a patient is having a stroke. You'd always want to have uh, 300 ma. Some people like to use modulation, some people don't. It is preferred not to use it however you can. A pitch of 0.9 is always acceptable with a 3 millimeter collimation use all your detectors and you would always want to do axial and coronal reconstruction. The only point in time whenever you would do a sagittal reconstruction is when you actually see raised intracranial pressure due to a lesion sitting in the inferior vault. Now it's really important when we align for a head CT it's different to MRI where we do a parallel line from the frenum magnum and the roof of cranium and you'd want to go up until you get to the vertex of the skull. In the coronal plane, you'd always want to be parallel to the midbrain. When we look for patterns of disease and analysis, we always look at the intraaxial, extraaxial, intraventricular, diffuse axonal, coop and counter -coop location. More importantly, you always need to determine where is the height of these bleed so for example is it uh, in the supratentorial or the superior vault or the infratentorial inferior vault then we need to understand is there any intracranial or midline shifting could because if there is then we need to then consider decompression and of course with the raised intracranial pressure we then need to understand is there herniation and herniation can occur at multiple areas so if we take a look here, the image on your left is a typical T1 weighted MRI axial sequence and at the same level with the same patient, it is a non-contrast axial image of the brain and you can actually see that in CT, the grey matter is actually white and the white matter is actually grey. And the basal ganglia, which is usually a grey matter islands, they're actually white. So the brain contains 98% of the body's neural tissue. 95% of the brain is actually made up of glucose and fat cannot cross the blood brain barrier. And the blood su supply to the brain is interesting because 15 to 20% of cardiac output at rest, anywhere between one to two minutes without oxygen results in brain damage. And Four minutes without oxygen is definite brain death. So if we look at the brain as a structure, 
We know that grey matter receives its nutrients through glucose in the CSF. Therefore, it is actually four times more denser than the white matter. Whereas white matter receives its nutrients from directly from the blood system or intracranial blood supply with extracranial circulation. And so therefore, when we come to talk about diffuse axonal injury, you will understand that the density difference between grey and white matter is because of the actual nutrients that it's taking on. So let's have a look at types of bleeds. But before we look at types of bleeds, we want to understand how blood appears in terms of density of Hounsford units and what's its relative radiological appearance. So if we look at both blood, which includes red blood cells and plasma, it would range between 35 to 45 Hounsford units. This then could further change if patients have thalassemia, which have increased iron in their blood system. Also, if patients are dehydrated. If you take serum alone or, you know, plasma, it's anywhere between 0 and 10 Hounsford units, which is similar to the density of water or CSF. And this occurs in about 55 to 65% of the blood system. And the remaining percentage is the red blood cell, which is between 60 and 90 Hounsford units. So if you actually look radiologically, 0 to 10 Hounsford units does not show you any density, whereas red blood cells on their own will show you a density of 60 to 90 Hounsford units. Now this is important because this is where hyper density is seen in the brain for an intraparenchymal bleed is because the red blood cell is not able to recirculate in the blood. Secondly, there's no plasma in there, so it's just localized in tissue. And this is why we get this high density. So if we look at hemorrhage and what happens over time, if you have a hyperacute hemorrhage, there is quite a lot of quite a lot of uh, oxyhemoglobin. When it's acute, you have intracellular deoxyhemoglobin with edema. And then as you start to come down to chronic, this is where it's completely filled with plasma or the inflammatory system response, such as macrophages, eosinophils, and so forth. And it actually creates a hemosiderin ring or a stain. And then after this, when it becomes chronic but non-active, then this actually is a hemosiderin stain, actually thins out and a lot of the inflammation is gone. However, radiologically, this is what happens. If you have an acute bleed, you will lose 1.5 Hounsford units of density per day from the day of the bleed. So for example, we know that an acute bleed is going to be anywhere between 65 and 90 Hounsford units because this is primarily concentrated with red blood cells only. And what is attached to red blood cells is hemoglobin, which is a metal. So a non-moving metal actually looks dense. And then it starts to become subacute after four days when the Hounsford unit becomes between 20 and 40 Hounsford units. And then more than 30 days, then it will become the same density as you would with CSF, which is water. And of course, the density is around about 0 to 30, which is very, very close to that of water. And so this is a typical example of a bleed. If you look at the image on your left, at the ambient cistern, there is a small subtle intensity there. However, three days later, bleeding has still increased and caused some shifting relative to the actual ambient cistern. However, more importantly, the cerebral aqueduct, which is actually seen lateral to it or medial to the bleed where the arrow is, you actually see the cerebral aqueduct has become smaller. And then over time, you start to see also shifting of the um, ponds and colliculi because of the increased pressure it's built in that cavity. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to this lecture. Just remember, everything is figure outable. For more free learning and education, please visit us at mdct.com.au. Also, we run a lot of conferences all over the world and please contact us and we'll be more than happy to come to your country. Take care.